I have 530 and would like to call the select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is comment on anything that is not on the agenda. So comment for anything not on the agenda. Seeing nothing, we'll move on to approval of the agenda. Moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, consent calendar. We have um, meeting minutes and warrants. Motion to approve consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, business, first up is discussing the public assembly ordinance. Sure, this is a policy question that comes to us from a more specific set of circumstance here. Um, we have a public assembly ordinance that was adopted and last modified in 1981. So it's older than parachute pants. Um, <laughs> And uh, in this particular case, there are, have been some tractor pulls up on a property that's bordered by Rogers and Williams Road. And um, it has raised the question, the way the ordinance is structured, there are sort of two um, different pieces to it. And one of them in the ordinance is that public assemblies are defined as any event with 500 or more attendees. And that one's pretty clearly and pretty spelled out pretty specific. When you read through the ordinance, you can see that there's the intent to regulate assemblies in some form because it mentions different provisions such as um, traffic sanitation and other public safety and health mechanisms that are in there. The way we've applied it has been a little more broadly in different cases. Some of it depends on, um, we've used it almost as a mechanism at times for events with less than 500 that are on town properties or use town infrastructure as a way to just conveniently sort of lay out any conditions. So I think most recently, something like a first Friday, where you may or may not have the 500 attendees, but we've used the public assembly permit process to say, here are the hours of operation, here are the things you need to consider, here's all these pieces fit together. And then we've had events that have been somewhere in between, with numbers somewhere in between. The Green Mountain Stage Race is on tonight. It's the threshold, but uses state and town and even school infrastructure to hold its event and a little bit of private infrastructure too but there's still that ability to regulate that assembly and then some smaller ones like the slab city mountain bike race which uses town properties town infrastructure and has a little bit of the events occurring on private so really what's before you is we've got this situation with the tractor pulls that have been occurring um, not entirely sure what the frequency but multiple times a, a summer potentially um, the public assembly ordinance says 500 people we went forward with an application to, or a process to say, hey, these require an application for a public assembly permit. In doing that, in talking through that, this 500 versus intent question comes up. Generally, in ordinances, the specific will trump the general. Um, so what we're looking for is, in addition to, to talking about this particular circumstance, which some of the neighbors and others have, have asked to appear before you before, at the heart of the question is, does the assembly ordinance apply either in letter or in spirit, which sort of policy interpretation do we want to go with because that will clarify in this circumstance is what does or doesn't apply. We did also look at any of the zoning considerations you have in your packets, what Stephen Bauer, who was our interim ZA in June, came up with in looking through the regulations. It does allow for a certain number of events, as long as they don't exceed, it's four times um, per year, and then there are day restrictions, consecutive days sort of embedded in there that you can host an event for as long as they're not the principal use of the property and a few other conditions. So you couldn't have an event space and try to skirt around some of the regulations by just limiting the number. If it's the principal use, you'd be in a different regulatory environment. That is a long way around to say we have an event occurring. The neighbors have expressed a concern. The property owners who are holding the event have said, well, your ordinance says this. We have a policy question about which one of these is applicable. It will matter in that it sets precedent moving forward and may require us to take some other adaptations for those events that have town infrastructure involved, town property involved, that, but have fewer than 500 people. We may be on sort of a case-by-case -case agreement basis for a while 
And the trick with ordinance is we couldn't just say, we want to amend the ordinance tonight, take action, and have it be effective. If we had an ordinance ready to go and you adopted it tonight, it's at least 60 days if there's no appeal before that ordinance is effective. And that's a statutory timeline, so we don't have any ability to do anything about that. If it were on the zoning change side of it, it's a different process involves the Planning Commission has different timelines as well. In either case, there isn't any alternative language that's ready to go anyway. Um, but you couldn't, even if you were ready, there's still a pretty long window. So whatever sort of the policy choices applies, unless or until that, that ordinance is amended. Um, and so there's a little bit of just seeking guidance. Do you want us to try to dig into to an ordinance update as well? So, so Trevor, if we, a, I'm sorry, Trini. if we look at this though, whether it's four events a year or 500 people or less, my understanding is the tractor pulls comply with both. If they're under the 500 and it's not the principal use, it would it would find that path where it doesn't require a permit through either process as currently written, right? Okay. So um, no matter which one you want to point to or which one we do, the tractor pulls are not, they're not an issue unless we go through the process of drafting a new ordinance and getting it adopted, at which point their season will be over. So it seems like the question tonight isn't whether they can or can't go on. It's whether we want to toss this issue to the Planning Commission to look for a, a revised, updated ordinance. And, and it might even be that the, the public assembly ordinance is something we draft in a different venue, unless what you're looking for is to embed it in the zoning regulations, just because it's a different regulatory document. So it might actually be one that we try to draft out of the manager's office and get ready for board action from there. Um, and that's also the entity that like takes the permits in and, and gets them back out after you take action. It seems like, though, we would be better off asking the Planning Commission to get involved to figure out what involved what should be in zoning what should be in an ordinance and have them go through the process of maybe holding some public input sessions to have that discussion of you know what where we should be in drafting that to list you know instead of us drafting it in a vacuum it seems like there's a lot of interest in this now that maybe there needs to be more of a public process and how that one is drafted So from a planning commission standpoint, being a person who was on that planning commission when we drafted all these new ordinances, um, we spent a great deal of time with this piece of four events a year. And so there was no public input, if I recall at the time, on that part of the ordinance or the, or the regulation so what was there was kind of just readopted because it hadn't been a problem in the past. And so when that process came up, they were also talking about other events where it's not just the tractor pulls, but it could be somebody who's you know holding a couple of weddings on their property or something like that. And uh, so I think we followed some state statutes on this also and this process, and I think that number of four events a year came through state statute. The 500 number, I'm not sure that's part of the ordinance, right? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the origin was. I don't know where it came from. Uh, I suspect it was probably event. There was something emergent that was specific to that. I think you're going to do a lot of research on this because yeah. now you've got the East Valley community holding a community-wide yard sale, so is that considered a public event? There was a conversation about whether it applied for that and was there a single location versus a coordinated series of locations, so does it count as one event, does it draw the 500, does it, how does it use infrastructure? Mm -hmm. there's, there's also the Morgan of course event that takes place. Uh, every fall as well that's been going on for years. I don't know what kind of numbers that draws, but 
they're actually functioning on public roadways, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so. there's a lot of things to consider here. What's on public land, what's on private land. And if I'm not mistaken, we're talking now about things that would require a permit. It doesn't mean that these sorts of events would not be allowed. They would just have to go through that process, right? Right, right. If, so if it hit the 500, there are 501 people showing up who would be permit eligible could go through the process. <coughs> well, when you do that, you're involving the police department, the fire department, the town highway department to make sure you're not creating an undue burden on those services or they've addressed those services. So did they hire a sheriff's department? Do they have EMT services there? And I've gone through this numerous times with RSL, even though I don't have to because I have a permit that gives me the right to do that stuff up there, but we've gone through that process anyways just to make sure that everybody's comfortable with what we're doing. Right. And we have a past practice of broader application, whether it be from the town's end or from an applicant end, too, that does allow us to answer some of these questions, have that kind of review of what's proposed. And so we would be when we would still need some mechanism for an event that's proposed that does involve town infrastructure. It may just not be through this vehicle. It may have to be through some other individual set of agreement, memorandum of understanding thing, unless or until there's a change to this or it hits the 500 person threshold and then that permit would apply. So it does create a little bit of a change in practice in the short term. Sorry about that. Oh, they turned that off. So we've used this a little more broadly to get to some of these other goals, but in that strict reading, you can make that case that if you don't have the number, it's not a public assembly as defined in that ordinance. So how does it fit? But we obviously wouldn't want an event with 498 people mm -hmm. on Merchant's Row with Merchant's Row closed. And, and obviously you can't just close a road because you feel like it, you feel like holding an event. There are some other provisions in place, but Use that as an example. That's we'd still have to to regulate that type of type of event. Relative to this specific event, the tractor pulls. Mm -hmm. What is the impact upon them of them upon public services and infrastructure? Is there There's any no impact on public services? Tom. Right, right. So, but yeah, I mean, given the the location, it hasn't. You know, there isn't. It, there hasn't been an intersection impact that's been reported, but if you don't go through the through a process to at least have some kind of conversation about it, it is also hard to answer the question because you don't necessarily know the parameters. There may be none in this case, but a similar event may have may have others. But if we don't if we don't have a review mechanism, it's unless something's reported or has happened, we don't we may not necessarily know. Mm -hmm. But I guess I guess my point is that. There are neighbors that are upset that this is happening at all, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that um, changing the ordinance that a permit is required for such an event um, addresses their concerns. Right? It just it just means that they have to go through another a set of hoops to, to get mm -hmm. permission, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be like they would not be allowed to do this. They would just have to get a permit. It, yeah, and then in seeking the permit, you could put conditions on hours whatever the ordinance specified for frequency of event, duration, um, any of those other factors that are hinted at or at least somewhat referenced in, in the current ordinance, you put those in as conditions of approval. If, if you needed to, if there was an impact on service or something anticipated or some other concern. But yeah, there still could be the potential to hold event to get the approval, even if all you did was lower that threshold from 500 to 100, say. It just steers this particular event and others of a certain number size through this this portal. Right. I, I guess I, I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, the, we're talking about the possibility of, of going through an ordinance revision process, which which is fine, but if at the end of the day we're not meeting the cons the concerns that are sort of driving this to begin with, I just want to make sure we kind of know that that's where we might be going, that if we're going to underneath uh, go through this process, um, that it should be because we're intending it to meet some sort of concern. So 
if, if we are, that's great. I'm just, I'm just not hearing that we are at the moment. Yeah, I think an ordinance review process would, would look at what's there and identify and or make recommendations for any changes in, in process practice, so numbers, definitions. So in the ordinance review process it was a public process. Yep. We would get in, we would get review. We would get comments from like some of these neighbors who could say, "This is a problem. Here's something you should consider having in the ordinance, so that this is less of an impact on the, the on the folks who live adjacent to." That. So is this going to lead to noise ordinances and other things during the daytime? Because right now. In my business, you know, there's people out there that are doing 400 person, 500 person events, weddings during the day, run to 10 o'clock at night. That's just they're allowed to do that. Some towns, you know, limit the time and they say the nice ordinance is 10 o'clock. Okay, Woodstock is an example. All right, so, you know, are we going to go down that path? And, you know, I'm pretty sure that when we did this from a planning commission standpoint, we looked this up and it was, there were allowed four events a year. And, uh, they're pretty vague about what, you know, there was no noise restrictions, but if you start doing that, then obviously you're going to have a bigger can of worms that you're going to open here. Oh, yeah, no, I can totally see that. Just I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm saying, like, as we, Liquor control we're, deciding, already... we're deciding to go through this process, I think we yeah. should have our eyes open in uh, terms of what it is that we're trying to accomplish. I'm totally right. agreeing with you, but you're also going to bump up against some state statutes here and, and property rights. So unless you want to get on that path, yeah. Which I don't think we're willing to go down to, you know, this was, you know, what, four or five years ago when we did this, you know, I think we kind of followed state statute and, uh, you know, felt that that was a pretty safe place to be. We did that with a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. So, we're not talking Woodstock here, you know, we're not talking Woodstock concert event, okay. We're talking about a small event that I believe is held mostly during the day, okay, and yeah, I'm sure that there's some noise associated with this, but you know, I live next to the interstate, there's a lot of noise <laughs> living next to the interstate, you know, so I'm hearing trucks race up and down 66, you know, I can walk out my door yard and hear that kind of stuff, is, are we going to start limiting jake brakes around town and those kind of things? Where are we going to go with this? How far is it going to go? There's also a case to be made that this is, how to put it, kind of a quintessential rural Vermont event. Mm -hmm. And if you're living in an agricultural community in rural Vermont, these kinds of events are traditional and commonplace. Kind of and, and I think we have to be cognizant of that, too. Um, is this the first time that this, and Trevor, I don't expect you would know, but perhaps some of the fellow select board members, is this the first time this, this not just this specific event, but this issue has come up around other events in our rural zone? Uh, I would hate to see us go down a slippery slope, as you've both suggested, for something that is an outlier relatively outlier complaint, if that makes sense. So, Tom, it's not the first time they've hosted the event. It's oh, been sure happening it for years. It is the first time that there's been a series of complaints from the neighbors, right. and it's the only event that I'm aware of that's drawn that. That's kind of what I was getting at, Trini. Thank you. I, I, I just, I worry that if we we turf this to the planning commission, look at rewriting the ordinance that we might be creating a, you know, I hate to use the old cliche, but a tempest in a teapot um, that might lead to further issues moving forward. If somebody wants to have their, 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 uh, their child get married on the property and have a large wedding reception and make use of a, a rain or shine tent and some live music up to a certain, I agree with time restrictions, you know, 8, 10 o'clock at night, whatever it might be. Uh, I don't have any issue with that. Yeah, that's but a noise ordinance thing, though. That could be yeah, addressed yeah. in the noise ordinance. Yeah, exactly. So um, if, if we move in this direction, we might be opening up a whole other avenue for a, a can of worms to just explode. So I think we need to be careful. 
I do think, just in, in looking back through the last year, this is one of the few events that isn't located here, kind of in the in the larger village area between, say, Fars Hill downtown and the rec field. You know, quite a few of the events seem to happen in that triangle. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a variety of reasons. So it's there aren't a lot of measurables, at least in that very short time frame. But if you play it out over years, I don't. You get well, me on April of twenty one. I click. <laughs> I, but I think the. The, the majority of the ones we hear from are looking to use some type of town asset, whether it's to close a street, it's to use, um, you know, parking lots, um, to have, you know, different things that are in the in the village center mostly, but, you know, to have the police block certain parts of the road while the bicycles go through on their race. You know, this one wasn't asking for any municipal services. So if, you know, I agree they ought to have to go through a process if they're asking for us to close a road or commit resources of some sort to them or take some action of a public asset. But, you know, we got to be careful or we're going to have applications up to the wazoo as every person decides to have a family reunion or a, you know, large 50th birthday party or a wedding or whatever. And I don't know that we want to get down into the weeds on some of this stuff either. So. I don't know. So, Perry, you're saying that the even though the ordinance dates back to the 80s, that you, that the planning commission reviewed this just a few years ago? We've looked at it in the zoning stuff. Okay, in zoning, you know, the zoning regulations were allow you to have four events a year, and I think we modeled that after what state statute said before it considered it a commercial venture. So, in other words, somebody who Let's just say somebody's got a large private property and they want to host weddings there. This happens in Stowe a lot, and places I've been happens a lot of places. Or somebody's got a beautiful looking property, it's great, it's gorgeous, and you know, it's got a great view of the mountain. Well, according to the state of Vermont, from what I could gather and what we looked at, was you're allowed to do four events a year at that property without having to go through any regulations or zoning changes or anything like that. So, you know, that happens quite frequently. I mean, we were constantly in places where somebody's rented their property two, three, four times a year. And so I don't see that as any different than this, okay? And if it's a noise issue, I don't know how you're going to control noise, you know, in the middle of the day. I mean, that's just, I mean, we're not talking like we're next to a quarry here or something. And, you know, it doesn't, you know, if you went through some active 50 requirements, I do know that, like, for example, with... Our project with the hotel up there, you know, when we went through this with the Act 250 thing and we're looking at doing, you know, attended space, you know, sound cutoff time was 10 o'clock and we're certain DB at the property line. But, you know, now we're in, that's a commercial venture. This is not a commercial venture. Right. So. Okay. And there's no development involved, right? So it doesn't even, and it's not a commercial, commercial event, so it doesn't even come close to triggering any. Uh, I mean, this is really a stretch, but Act 250 review, um, such as a larger scale commercial development for an event space on a farm would, mm. uh, perhaps. Um, Not seeing that. No, 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 I don't see it at all. So maybe the action item is to change our assembly permit so it's only required when it's impacting municipal resources or will have more than 500 people in attendance or happen more than four times a year. So it's picking up on the ones that are not covered by the ordinance or are going to impact municipal resources. Yeah, I, I, I think that an update of a number of our ordinances is, is due just because they're fairly aged, and we run into some of these nuanced things across them in application um, throughout. So I, we're, we're due for that kind of review round. And in a process like that, those are the types of adjustments you might be looking to make to say, well, how are we using the tool? What do we want to use it for? And then we craft the ordinance around that. So that if it is about over a certain attendance size, utilizing municipal property or infrastructure, other considerations, that uh, becomes part of that regulatory framework through that and then clarifies when you need a permit where you go to get it and what the conditions are there so then we're not trying to figure out what was the legislative intent and 
1981 when the ordinance was created. Um, well, and there, you know, there's probably been changes to statute, and I think we need to align ourselves with some of that stuff. So, yeah. you know, but, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to start reviewing that again. We can start with this one. Our traffic ordinance, for example, I'll still reference the Randolph Village Fire or the Police Department. Right. So for tonight, are we looking at, you know, right now there's there's no action we can take tonight um, between the ordinance and the zoning. It's an allowed use. It's going to take a change to one or the other to have any impact on it. Um, so what I'm hearing is the only direction is to look at whether the ordinance needs to be updated to kind of be in sync more with state laws and the zoning regs. Is that what everybody else is thinking? That's what I'm thinking. Makes sense to me. Are we gonna hear public comments, Trini? Well, I don't want to get into a discussion of whether we should or shouldn't allow tractor pulls because I think that's irrelevant tonight. You know, they're allowed. We have an ordinance that allows it. We have zoning that allows it. We can't do anything about it. That's that's the way. That's the way those were written and passed. And so we're not going to do anything if we have people who want to talk about anything as far as whether they want to participate in the public process of rewriting the ordinances or some change like that, I'm more than willing to entertain that type of comment, but I don't want to get into debating whether this event should or shouldn't be allowed to happen because our rules allow it to happen. Looks like we've got one in the audience. If you could yes. just identify yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Judy Miro. I live on Rogers Road. So you're saying they can hold the event one day per month. What about uh, creep? What if they start setting up the day before and they're still working on removing equipment the day after and there's continued noise and other interruptions? I believe the ordinance is for like three days. Three days. Four, got event, four events up to four days for each event. So they're actually only doing one day and a day of setup and whatnot, they could have the event all four days. They could have a an event where they brought in people, they camped on site, and they pulled tractors for four days. Is there, anything, all, about is there anything about notification for letting the neighborhood know about the dates? No. Oh. There's not in the Probably. not no, in no. the audience. Great. There's a lady in the front with a red shirt had her hand up. Yes. Um, Just identify yourself. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm Christine Burke. I live on Hilltop Drive. Um, mm -hmm. And there's there's been some discrepancies here already that I'm hearing from you and the board. I've read through the Randolph land use regulations and I've looked at uh, what the uses are for land in our rural um, residential district there's, there's no such allowance of a tractor pull. So I don't want to talk about that. But what I do want to talk about is the fact that these people who are putting this on are using some misconceptions. For example, they're saying these are temporary events. These aren't temporary events. No these are permanent events there's because no, there's no provision they have, in there for weddings either. So you know you, we don't have regulations that deal specifically with weddings. But, but that anybody is, can that have is, a wedding on that property. That is an example of a temporary event because that's a one-time occurrence. You don't that's know that for sure. I'm telling temporary, you right now. Well, temporary to me and weddings mean one time. That's a, that's a that's definition. That's what happens. It happens well, one time. I'm sorry, but that's Literacy. the way the regulations. You, you could actually have four weddings at one property every year if you wanted to. Okay, it happens. Okay? I know because I'm in the event business and I see it happen. You're talking about the structure. So are we going to ignore the rest of the intent of the ordinance just based on the criteria that 500 people and ignore the rest of the intent? Because it's pretty clear to me that there was some intent to protect the public from noise pollution, pollution itself from the, you know, the exhaust. My house shakes. It's not living next to the interstate, bud. You guys want to come out to my house? I invite you to come out. 
Yeah. Yeah. You see what I'm talking, talking about? about? We're in the weeds. So this is apples and oranges. Well, okay. A wedding catch no noise. And my name's Mark yes, Walker. In a residential neighborhood, you don't have 106 dBs on a I have to wear hearing protection on my property. Does a wedding is that what you're telling me? Does a wedding have a siren blowing constantly about every 15 minutes? We don't have a noise ordinance addresses that. Then maybe we should. Maybe we should. That's what we're talking about. Maybe we should look at the ordinances and adjust the ordinances. Okay, but right now, you know, what we said here at the beginning is that we don't have anything that addresses this right at this point. In the future, it's highly possible that we could kick this back to the Planning Commission and we could have that conversation. And our zoning ordinances need to be rewritten also. I don't believe these people have a zoning permit to operate this. They don't need one. Because again, you're assuming that they are allowed to have this temporary event when everything they use is permanent. They removed soil and put a dirt track there. They made that track permanent. They maintain it. There's a they permanent structure there now. Yes, they put up a building now this year alone. That's why we're here. It's gone too far. Okay. That building can be that no, that's can something be that you can do. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. They put it there. They put it there to serve food and sell items. It's a money-making adventure. No, it is not. Nonprofit or nonprofit. We do you all have, this for charity. You have a 501c3. You are listed as a nonprofit with the federal government, IRS. It's in process. In process. It's okay. in process. So you don't. You're not a nonprofit at this going point. On for three years. Three years. Three years no. Nope. You don't have it. So we got one more in the back with a hand up. My name is Christy Partlow. I'm one of these people, as you keep putting us. Um, so we host these events. We donate the proceeds that we get from organizations. Last year, we donated seven hundred and fifty dollars to the Veterans Home in Northfield. This year, we're donating all proceeds that we receive to two people, two women who are currently fighting cancer. We do not make any money off of this. We do not keep any money. We actually, I myself, put in about $1,500 a year to this. And we, we built this, the whole family puts in money. We built this as something for my grandson to do with my, or my son to do with my dad. And it's an event that we do. Do it at your house. <laughs> Excuse me? Was that rude to you? We're neighbors. Mm -hmm. You could come to us as a neighbor and be like, <clears throat> You could have come to us and asked. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But you didn't. You could have come to us and asked if so, you could buy your house. That's, that's it wasn't going on when I bought my house. So I don't have any reason to think that that was going to happen. Hey, well, hey one at a time. It's please. our property. Yeah. We're allowed to do what we can do. Ah, yeah. 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 I guess the last my speakers at your property. As long all day as long, we're not violating any ordinance. And you guys are saying we're, we're within the ordinance. If we find out that we're not doing something that we should be doing, then we're happy to do that. I don't understand why we can't be neighborly about this. Why, you know, if you have a problem with, you know, the horn going off, let us know. Maybe we, maybe we can remedy that. Did any of you come to us? No, not one of you has come to us. Nobody ever came to me either, so I wouldn't expect you. Then step up and be the bigger man and come to us and say, Sure. Thank you. My name is Eric Henry. I live on uh, Rogers Road right across from the tractor pools. We moved to rural Vermont because we like rural Vermont. <clears throat> I would caution you against zoning rural Vermont into Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I think it's time to, we kind of got our direction at this point. Um, Thank you all for coming. Trini, uh, if I may ask, does this need a, if we are going to look at, as has been suggested by the town manager, and we seem to be in consensus here, uh, revisiting some of our uh, longstanding uh, regulations, would this require a referral to the Planning Commission to come back with a revision that's consistent with con current Vermont law? It doesn't. The town manager can communicate that to the planning commission. Yeah. All right, moving on, let's consider adjusting the water wastewater bill for 77 North Main Street.
So Chris is on with us, and uh, he provided you with some information ahead of time. And he will be able to run you through the details of this one, as I understand it. This one has its origins in a burst pipe. Burst pipe. I don't know if you're talking, Chris, you're still on mute. Yeah, it comes with a nice tractor pull. See? This is not a wedding song. You gonna do me okay? Now we got you. We got you now. Um, so, uh, Brian Murdoch owns 77 North Main Street. It's a small apartment building. Uh, sometime between January 22nd and January 25th, uh, a water line in the crawl space under the building uh, froze and burst. Um, he did not call us directly on it. He called the plumber to, plumber to come try to ratify the situation. After having to touch base with a couple of different plumbers, um, we finally got one to come in, get the problem solved, get the water off, make the repairs. Um, then he got his bill from us, realized why his bill was so high. He reached out to us to seek an adjustment for the wastewater portion of the bill. Um, in his letter, he requests both, but I informed him the water has to go through an abatement process, not through the adjustment process. Town um, staff did go over and verify that there was a repair made in the as well as I spoke with two of the plumbers that were called and uh, and the plumber that made the actual repairs. Uh, so we believe this did happen. It was a high use for that particular quarter for him. Um, if you notice that his average usage uh, is typically around 26 units per quarter, that particular unit or quarter, they had 94 units. Uh, Results in a, just, a potential adjustment of $850, which would be just the wastewater portion. On June 7th, the Water and Sewer Committee voted to adjust to the average billing for the wastewater services. We have done this in the past with multiple other properties. So, Chris, the request on the table is for the board to approve adjusting that invoice by $850. Is that correct? The town manager can do the adjustment up to $500. Uh, obviously, this one exceeds that. Okay. So, you just need a motion to. Uh, sure. I'll make a motion to uh, adjust the wastewater portion of this to the $850. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Uh, reviewing the pretreatment discharge permit determination for New England Precision. Chris is still with you for this one. Provided some materials ahead of time. There have been some conversations going back a few months now about some elevated lead and copper levels that were showing up um, in the system. And so these conversations have involved DEC and the folks from New England Precision. And the recommendation you see before you flows from that process. But Chris could certainly give you the details on those conversations and, and what's being recommended and why. Um, so as some of you may recall, education increase late last year, um, the increase that allocation will, when they started trying to discharge at those levels, they started having issues with their discharge parameters that were in place. Um, they 
through some conversations with myself, we ended up reaching out to the pre-treatment program, which we have Garrett Walsh from the pre-treatment program. I believe he's on as well. But the newer allocation levels, the lead and copper levels that were being discharged by New England Precision are highly impactful at the wastewater plant and to the environment as well. It was making the plant meet those parameters. Um, NEP wishes to continue at the 2,000 gallons per day, which triggers a pretreatment um, permit. Uh, again, Garrett will have to explain any questions you guys have on that. Um, but the pretreatment program presents um, a 25, a recommended a 25% of the allocation, so to speak, of our lead and copper levels. Um, the 25% is above and beyond what the town already sees from the drinking water sources um, due to the hardness of water, that type of thing, um, and any other sources that we can't regulate that come in. So this is of that portion above and beyond those numbers. So the Water Sewer Committee um, recommended going with the 25%, which led max per day of 0.015 pounds per day, or a monthly average of 0.008 pounds per day. And then on the copper, um, 0.13 pounds per day, or a monthly average of 0.052 pounds per day. And that's based on current water quality standards as set forth by the EPA. Great, do we have any questions on that? Thoughts, Trevor? <laughs> None. <laughs> None, it seems like everybody understands that this is something we've I will have to do. Um, yeah. So, uh, and DEC has, has tried to engage early and often, both with us and, and mm -hmm. with the business, so that there wasn't any surprise. But they right. didn't suddenly get a letter that said you have to meet some more stringent requirements that, that may involve the installation of equipment or, or, or other processes. And the Wastewater Water Committee met with NEP and DEC, too, I think, prior to its recommendation. So, um, I think it's Obviously. these are numbers, everybody. They are. Sort of the regulations state what they state, and and and, uh, and there seems to be agreement that we have to <laughs> it's time to abide by them and do what needs to be done. To abide by them, you mean <coughs> knowing one precision? Yeah, to make sure because they got the extra allocation, so those levels go up correspondingly. So we need to take additional action to make sure that it all fits within that overall water quality load as it relates to the copper and lead. Hence the three trees on the other side. Right. Yeah. So, so they're not opposed to any of that, obviously. Yeah. They just want to comply. All right. And, and they need to know from us what up to what limits they have so that they know what kinds of equipment to that they that they need to install. <clears throat> so that, that that was the that was sort of the big thrust of, of the meetings that we had was that depending upon how much allocation we would give them, they might have different sorts of things that they need to look at in terms of what kind of processes they need to engage in order to meet those um, those limits. So they're looking for a cap from us? That's what this 25% is yeah, basically. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the cap. So, so we're basically saying to them, we're going to give you a, a quarter of the plant's capacity for these kinds of contaminants, leaving three quarters for other well, for for other possibilities, you mm -hmm. know, for other other industry, other things that might that might come on down the other line. So it seemed like a, a, a reasonable okay. sort of middle ground, um, and and doable um, at their end. Okay. Did I read it right that they're already over the maximum for the town at some point? I am not sure about that. Did you hear that question, Chris?
Yeah, I think you might be having a connectivity issue, Chris. So you, if you tried, you may want to try try again. You hear me now? Now yeah. I got you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that question about? I didn't really hear it. Um, my question was, are, is New England Precision, I read it carefully, but not knowing all the details, is New England Precision already in some categories over what the whole town is allowed? Uh, that is correct. They're currently um, discharging too much lead and copper, and uh, it's actually putting the wastewater plant at jeopardy as well. The numbers are exceeding. Uh, the treatment options, uh, they could, the state kind of looked at it as how they handled metal finishers. Uh, New England Precision isn't a metal finisher, but they did kind of compare them. And the numbers are very easily achievable by current technologies. There's metal finishers, not just in the state, but across the country that are achieving much stricter limits um, than this. And how is, how is this enforced? Um, do they report to us regularly? Well, they report to just us. Once the state uh, implements a pretreatment uh, permit, they will have to um, report to them every month as I report to them, to the town. Um, and then they'll also, we'll see a copy of those reports so that everyone knows what's going on. Good. Is this a, does this take much time to administer on your part? I'm framed. They're already in the middle of engineering systems. They just kind of have to decide which to go with and forward. The good part is, is that right now, while milligrams per liter wise, um, they're causing the plant to be kind of on a, a high level. The pounds per day portion, um, we're not hitting because we're not at our 400,000 gallons per day that were permitted through the state for the town. We're half that on our worst days right now. So we have some buffer room there so that we're not truly hurting the environment yet. Um, so as soon as they get you know, they can get, it gives them a little time to get that up, but foreseeable one to two years, but I don't know if it'll take that long. Is there a timeline that they discussed in your meeting, Larry? Um, in terms of how, getting, how much time they have what to, they, what they could, how they, how long it would take them to accomplish to get, this? Um, I don't recall talking about a timeline. Doesn't seem like it take. Yeah, Garrett, is that one you think you? I thought I heard you say, Garrett yeah, switched DNC. Uh, for everyone that I haven't met, uh, my name is Garrett Walsh. Uh, I work with the Vermont DEC. Put my video on. Hi everyone. Um, I work with Nick Gianetti with the pretreatment program. Um, for timeline, uh, for this all star, we need to first have them submit the permit uh, application. Uh, which we've really just been waiting for this allocation to be given out by the town of Randolph. Um, and overall, to the timeline that we would give NEP to meet these limits uh, would come down to a number of factors, but it'd probably come down to maybe a year, depending on cost, but also with supply chain issues, we might be able to give them a little bit more time to meet the limits as well. So it's, I can't give a final answer on the time frame, but you can think of maybe a year, give or take. Yeah. Okay. Reasonable. Any more questions? If not, a motion? I think for me, I'm good with that. 
this is your committee. <laughs> yeah, but that's why it shouldn't be my motion, right? I don't know. If no one's got the. What do we have to do in allocation? I think it's. We're, we're going to um, approve the proposed limits for um, for New England Precision in terms of uh, a new allocation. Whether it's um, 10, 25, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, in the in our um, basically, we would be we would be proposing the the specific limits um, that we have in front of us that that Chris mentioned earlier the, the the specific amount of lead per day and the monthly average and the copper per day and the monthly average is 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 that's how we um, um, that's the that was the motion that we passed um, mm -hmm. in the water wastewater committee. Yeah. So basically, as it's written, right? So, you could, yeah, I mean, I'll just read it because it's in front of me. I move to the, that we accept the pounds per day listed under the 25% allocation recommended limits from the letter to the town from the state pretreatment program dated April 20, 2022. The limits based on current water quality standards in 2022 would be lead maximum per day, 0.15 pounds per day. Lead monthly average 0 0.008 pounds per day, copper max per day 0.13 pounds, and copper monthly average 0 0.02, point, I'm sorry, 0 0.052 pounds per day. I'll make that motion since you just read it. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I'll make the motion as as Select Board Member Sakowitz has has stated it. Second. Can we make just one friendly uh, amendment? There's a typo in the lead max per day. It should be 0 0.015 oh, rather than actually, 0 0.15. That, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. That was my yeah. transposition with error. With that uh, correction. Okay. Second with the correction. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next up is to consider the recommendation for a local cannabis control commission. We have someone from the Planning Commission. Is it Jeff? Yep, Jeff Grout is here with us digitally. Yes, hello. The, um, I think you all had a copy of the resolution in your packet. Um, there's a lot of references to um, the state statutes, but I think there's enough explanation of what they are. Um, in summary, Having a, a local cannabis control commission, um, which would we 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 recommend it would be um, proposed or the the makeup of the commission would be um, led up by by you by the select board and it could be run as the liquor board is run now or it could be a separate commission from members of the community and. I'm just going to leave it there and I'll answer any questions that you might have. But, um, you know, basically, I guess what's important is with local, with a local commission, at least the, 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 there's a few, they're, they're enforcing the regulations wouldn't be one of the key responsibilities because the Vermont um, Cannabis Control Board is, has, um, just pages and pages, you know, very strict regulations of how they do that. The, the local commission is mainly just so you'll keep track of who's applying and make sure that their um, operations meet local zoning ordinances. And they'd work closer with the ZA to um, make that and really just record keeping at that point. It does allow the town to have a licensing um, process. It does not require that. Um, to have a, a formalized um, licensing process with the town that they would then bring to the cannabis control board um, when they apply, or to the licensing board when they apply for the license. I don't know if we want to uh, go to that extent, but that's um, that could be part of the process. And I guess the other thing it would allow public comment as well. So when when um, it would be. I think that's what would happen when you do the liquor board. The problem is I don't really know how the liquor board works. So for us to recommend <laughs> the same as the liquor board, um, 
that's your call. But um, I think if it works for the Liquor Control Board, it would work for the Cannabis Control Commission as well. What, one of the key things you can do as a Liquor Control Commission that you'd be able to do as a Cannabis Control Commission is <coughs> there's an issue with what we think of as the nuisance types of potential violations. You can take action on a license in response with some of those things in mind. Noise, to use one from earlier tonight, for example, um, or any of those types of, of things. So it gives you a little bit of a hook. Should you have a nuisance issue that comes up with an individual licensee that you may not otherwise have without it? Much like with liquor control, you could deny somebody had multiple violations for serving underage and you had a establishment that continually flaunted other rules and general neighborliness. Um, yeah, if, 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 if I remember correctly, we basically agreed that this was a good idea, and we, yeah. and the, but, but that we wanted guidance in terms of what the specifics mm -hmm. of it would look like, and this document that we have now gives us those. Kind of gives us that. The, mm -hmm. the, the, yep. Yeah, you had two conversations at least back in the, mostly the winter time, I think. Yeah. I thought we had the conversation that we wanted the Cannabis Control Board to also be the select board, like the Liquor Control Board was, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There seems to be agreement. Anybody have any further questions or want to make a motion to move it? I will, uh, I will move um, the draft resolution for Randolph's Cannabis Control Commission. I don't need to read the whole. No, but if you could include incorporation in the meeting minutes, that will skip the need to read aloud. I will move uh, the draft resolution for Randolph's Cannabis Control Commission as incorporated in the meeting minutes. And that that board, that should be the select board? Uh, and, and, you know, with adding the, 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 mission, uh, the uh, motion as it reads gives us the option of it either being the select board or an appointed um, body by the select board. I would I would move that we designate the Randolph Select Board as the uh, uh, Cannabis Control Commission. And I'll, and I'll make that as part of the resolution. I'll second that. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. A request to formally name the Randolph Union High School Access Road. So this one came to us from the folks at the school. They'd like to name the unnamed <laughs> access road as Jane Drown Way in honor of a longtime teacher who recently retired, as I understand it. Or still there, has not retired, but a longtime teacher. <laughs> my, my mistake. Um, Let me tell you how long? <laughs> I, I think we heard 50 <laughs> years, years maybe, was she? she won. First year, I, my yeah. first year there, she was there. Yep. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <Jeff Benson>. <laughs> <laughs> That's 50 years. That's yeah. an incredible tenure, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so you've got in your materials some of the things. We reached out to, it, it's a bit of an odd duck in that it's not a public road in the sense many of our others are. It's not a private drive in that it's an access to a school. Um, and it's not really a driveway either, and it is public property because it's school property, but it's not municipal property. So we reached out to say what kind of naming conventions apply. It does seem like, and part of why the recommended motion's written to ask us with the next steps is there's some follow-up questions on exactly how do we get there if you're agreeable. Um, if we followed some of the naming conventions for other types of roads as recommended by VLCT's Municipal Assistance Center, We'd schedule a public hearing, say, at your August meeting, where you'd take any feedback on that and could formally name the, the, the road Jane Drown Way. Um, it may have an impact on some E911 addressing issues, primarily with the, um, when you look at the superintendent's office, there's the blue-ish garage behind it. We're working with them to distinguish, is the primary access off Central Street, or is it really off the access of road? And so if if we ain't get Jane Drown Way, that one might be renumbered and renamed as what, 22 Jane 32, something like that. <coughs> Jane Drown Way, as opposed to how it's currently addressed. Thankfully, because of that, it doesn't seem like it would impact anybody else. Though we had some conversations that, with E911 that were a little convoluted about what really needed to change. Um, so 
So we'd look to determine it if you're agreeable and pin down the process. If it turns out they can name it on their own, then. Um, but it appears like it makes some sense to run it through this system, given what it is. So then there's a formal name, formally blessed, E911 compliant, um, just in case. But so it's really just if you're agreeable, you're tasking us to go forward with next steps with an eye toward a public hearing in August on the whatever the next meeting date there, 11th, I want to say, but I don't know if it's right. <coughs> yes. The August 11th being a hearing date, if needed. Oh, I think we should move forward with that. There was some talk about the high school maybe having to be redone. There was, but that'd be one of those to try to clarify. It seems like maybe it would just be this one building and some further clarification, but... That'd be one of those. We'll keep running it down. Just keep looking at it and see where, yep. whether it's all the way through or whether you just terminate it. Yeah, because we're looking at it locally on the ground, and you know, when folks are looking at, very nice, but you know, still digital imagery. So what looks maybe like it's more connected or more adjacent sometimes isn't. Mm -hmm. So we'd look to clarify that. So before you did anything, we'd come back and say, if you do this, then the high school gets renumbered. You know, this other structure does. We'd, we'd be able to pin that down with them by that. That would get put in with our mileage for the state? No, I think no. it would just be formally named. It still wouldn't be a one, two, or three class highway, so. Is, is there any, like, practical benefit to having this? I hesitate to call it a street. It's sort mm -hmm. of, because it's a street, it's a very weird street. Um, I guess. But, um, to have, this, to, to have this um, as, have an official name? I, I think from an E911 response, if you had a, an ambulance, for example, first responder called out and they knew they had to go to Jane Drown Way versus the entrance to the high school, mm. they go around Forest Street. Not that it's a huge property, obviously, but you go around to the Forest Street side instead. A lot of private lanes that are named already. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, just wondering if there's I, a, I mean, that's really, you know, other than the, the honorarium, the practical impact is it might might make it easier to respond in an emergency situation if you had something on that access road. Um, you know, it's on this side rather than... Well, that's why it seems yeah. like it would be, you got a Forest Street side, you got a yeah. Central Street side, kind of need to work that piece out. Yeah. So... And one of the things we thought of doing is even if they just named a segment of and there may be a way to essentially rather take the whole drive if you end it as a segment a little bit earlier, it clearly cuts mm -hmm. that point. So it may even be in part of that, well, what if we essentially cut Jane Drown Way here? Which would be the central, the Forest Street side. Right. Then, then what would you do on the Central Street side? Anything? Yeah, that something? would, yeah, that would, well, that would be the Jane or Drown be Way side. Oh, like around the school? Yeah, change, it, that would be on the Central Street side would be the renamed okay. portion and then Forest Street would be the other. Okay. We just want the 911 people to go to the uh, wrong entrance. Yeah, we don't want to something. make it more complicated or cause more renumbering, but I, th I think we can get there with them. This is yeah. not an uncommon evolutionary conversation no. okay. with, with, uh, with them. Alrighty. Do we have an E911 coordinator? You do. Eight. <laughs> Other duties. Oh yeah, we even put no. that. Yeah. <laughs> we were counting certain tasks up today. Oh, we didn't get that one on the list. It's eight. <laughs> so do we need a motion, or can we just proceed without? I think if you're good, we'll take it forward from here. If that's what the consensus is, I don't know that you need a formal motion, unless or until it's time to act. Okay. And we'll queue it up for whatever needs to happen on the 11th to make it formal. Sounds good. All righty. Sounds good. Um, the paving bids are not on tonight, is that correct? I think, yeah, if you guys are okay, we, we can take them off. We got the bids in yesterday. We've still got to go through them. There's quite a wide spectrum based, I think, largely in part. We did an addendum. We followed our own RFP. It presented some pretty variable prices amongst the, the three bidders. Um, and really the addendum was about clarifying what we were after. 
And so they run the range from what we got back ranges from 450 to 1.1 million dollars. So it's a pretty big spread, and we need to uh, to look into those. So we may or may not ask for some sort of capability to take special action. Say next week, once we go through them, can kind of pull them all apart, see what the per tonnage is, figure out. I suspect the discrepancies are in the original bid as it went out at a broader scope of work attached with it based on what we were going to do with the shim piece and in terms of what we were going to put back in before the actual shim layer itself or the overlay layer I mean the shim layer was going to be more substantial and more universally applied and so what we clarified in the addendum was really what we want you to do is to create a nice level surface for which that overlay level can adhere and I suspect that's one bit it on that spec and the others I'm guessing bit it on the other because they're nearly double. And be able to see what the one has is. nearly twice the asphalt um, when you think of it that way. So yeah. The thing is, if it's at the four hundred and fifty two nine sixty one number, you we budgeted for three thirty five for a particular project, but at four fifty, which is kind of where we were thinking this, if we had any luck, actually, this could come in as a number. Um, there is that capacity in the paving reserve while still leaving nearly a similar amount in there to build a multi-year plan off of before you get into whatever transfers are in the budget for this year. I forget if it's 75 or 100,000 that's scheduled to go in as well to boost that. So it steps us ahead because there's quite a bit of paving, nearly 20,000 linear feet. And yeah, it's all overlay, but that'll improve maintenance, ride, all of those things, safety. Um, so we could, we could do both at that number, obviously. You get at the others where either emptying out that entire entire uh, war chest or we don't have enough but um, so we'll, we'll pick through those yeah. with an eye toward or, you know, a good recommendation that looks at fairness too so mm -hmm. but it was pike blacktop and fresh coat were the three that that came in we did what we did last year we sent it out we had an expanded list this year we sent it directly to the vendor sent the addendum directly to a vendor list they're all the the, the main ones that do paving work in this area or in Vermont, and then we posted it, you know, on the website and published it in the paper in accordance with policy. And ended up with three. We ended up with three, which is last year we had two, so right. we're we're heading in the right right direction. Um, well, I think there's yeah. is there a limit on the okay the bid itself? <clears throat> uh, we didn't put a limit. We just essentially said. We can eject, I mean, accept, reject, or seek to modify and, and just show us what the pricing is. I think, practically speaking, that 450 mark probably is somewhere in that range, would be what you could consider the funding limit. Yeah. I was thinking for this year, regardless of how many projects it, it covers, too. I was thinking time. <coughs> time, oh, time yeah, minutes. time the RFP wanted the work done, there's a date. Um, a little bit earlier than last year's date. I think it's in October. Um, so there would be a start and end before. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get those queued up and get that out to you. But. Okay. Move on to discussing reallocation of the hybrid positions. Yep. <laughs> I think we've had this conversation a little bit in the past, but we, before I arrived, I think two, it was two highway positions, if I'm not mistaken, were taken and created into what we've called the hybrids. So they're split half a year, more or less, with buildings and grounds and half a year with highway. Usually it's been summer with buildings and grounds, highway in the winter. That was the idea. We've had a hard time filling them, keeping them filled, keeping any interest. They've been vacant effectively since January. Um, and the idea has come up internally in talking with those two departments that rather than trying to hire the hybrid, because a lot of times what they do is they, you know, highway could use this extra body on a culvert um, project, say, but that's when building the grounds needs them for one of their maintenance activities as well. Um, so the idea came up talking with those departments if we took the two and just split that capacity amongst them so one goes back to highway, uh, essentially, and then one would go with buildings and grounds. So we don't lose any positions. We're not losing any of that workload. We're just essentially taking two people who would have shared it and putting all of it in one and all of it in the other, depending on the department. Um, 
and it seemed to work for both Harold and John in terms of this designated to move forward. And they both actually have ideas, potential candidates to fill those roles. Anecdotally, what we heard from a lot of potential applicants was if you had a CDL, you'd qualify for the highway half of the hybrid, and you wanted to use that CDL, drive truck, drive equipment, and those folks didn't necessarily want to cut grass in the summer and or dig graves. Um, at that point, was a big part of that. Sent more than one applicant away. Um, and then conversely, the folks who were interested in those pieces either didn't have a CDL or didn't have any interest in, in, in plowing snow at that level in the winter. And so, you know, didn't apply uh, based on that. So it was a way to try to fill those slots. Those have been the vacancies we've carried the longest in some form. Um, we've had at least one open at all times, except for about a four week period in the fall. Before one of them, we hired for a hybrid, moved over to water, wastewater. Mm -hmm. Are you saying this wasn't our best idea ever, but it was before you came, right? Well, no, no, I, I think it was a solid idea. I think it just it was difficult in practice. Um, you know, certainly I think the intent to get that work covered using existing resources was, was worth a try. Um, I think if we split them, it might make it a little easier to, to hire and retain. I think the other change we have is we now have a highway manager that's keeping the guys busy and doing a lot more pre-planning and whatnot. So some of the challenge was we had all summer long, two or three hanging out at the garages. There's not much to do. And we were getting complaints that the cemetery wasn't mowed. And, you know, there was different issues of trees not getting cut out of the right of way and, and whatnot. So it, the idea was to, I got these resources standing around in the garage. Maybe we should. And then the union said, not unless it's in their job description. So we changed the job description. But now that I think all the ones that are in the highway department are out, there's a lot of work being done. And they're doing it internal versus hiring contractors. It makes sense to give them a year round workforce. We just completed North Randolph Road was the one you were notified of directly, but they just replaced a culvert on Hollyhock that's long been on a wish list and had thought at one point that we may or may not be able to do it ourselves. And now we're going up to do the Howard Hill Grants and Aid Project with our own resources in addition to being more expansive in pothole patching. And, um, and that's all just in the last few weeks, which that would have last summer seemed like a Monumental task. So it would have been <laughs> remarkable to have had that happen last summer. Um, wow, that's so great. No, we're, yeah. And that's a, th that's a three, three and a half week we're, load. Sounds amazing. Yeah. I think we've made some, some really yeah. good decisions in that respect because I think things like that are yep. you know, paying off in spades right now. Yeah. Wow, that's so wonderful. Entertain a motion to make the change in the positions. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Action on the VCDP forms for the North Reservoir. Forms should look familiar every time we get a grant from community development. We file out a form or fill out one of these forms and send it back in. Wish we could do this sort of as a blanket annual thing. Um, and it just covered all grants because it's essentially the same reach. So this one is for that $300,000 grant from VCDP toward the North Wells and, uh, and tank project. And it's part of just trying to get to, we're still trying to work our way towards the grant agreement itself. Um, and this is one of those pieces. And then we've started to collect the others. and. Is this texting while driving? Is that a new one they snuck in? <laughs> New-ish, I think the last few years, so. If you're gonna sign this, pal, you're gonna have to stop texting while you're driving around there. Just listen to Springsteen and focus, right? <laughs> I'll move that we accept the municipal policies and codes as required by the Vermont Community Development Program. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
motion carries. <clears throat> Next up is considering appointing an interim zoning administrator. This is just formalizing. You previously appointed me as interim deputy zoning administrator as a in case of emergency break glass option when we had Stephen Bauer. Um, Stephen has, as you know, accepted full-time employment in Woodstock. We closed the office for about a week and a half to try to work out another interim arrangement with Two Rivers. Um, we're at the spot where we had to reopen the office. We have assumed zoning <laughs> administrator duties for the time being, so this would make me the full interim zoning administrator formalizes it, we're probably okay with the other one, but I, I, this would be cleaner as we sign things and if anybody has to go back through the record. The idea would be to just do this just long enough um, until either there's a full-time hire or some other interim option would be identified. It has begun this week in earnest in terms of we've started the duties and it's um, certainly motivating to fill the role in some other way. <laughs> but this will this will certainly help us get and remain street legal. I'll move that we appoint the town manager as the interim zoning administrator, and I think he deserves this good step up. The new title duties as a side. Yeah. <clears throat> I was going to say, with our condolences. <laughs> yeah. I, I will accept those for sure, yeah. <laughs> I'll second that. There, I thought it was going to die. I have no second for you. No, I, I, I was rooting for it. I was thinking about maybe if I cut, cut the sound. I already jumped in. So. Yeah, I can't, can't let you off the hook. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thanks. Um, we're now on to appointments. So we have the tree warden. We have two applicants for tree warden and two for arts council, right? Yes. yes. Yep. Yep. Hopefully, everybody saw you've got. Jeff there, who was listed in the packets, and then Sam Lincoln's materials came in today, and we sent them along. Sam's here. I don't know. I don't know. Jen Jeff's here as well. Um, and then there were two for the Arts and Culture Committee. And you do have, I suppose, theoretically, you do have two tree warden positions in the statute of divisions, both a tree warden and a deputy tree warden. I would uh, just have to say, I don't think you can get much more qualified than the individual that wrote the laws and helped clean up the programs at the state level and issue the guidance to the towns. That's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. He's here tonight to, to chat with us about that if we'd like, right? <laughs> I think we have two candidates, two positions. I think we could probably fill them both for sure. So, any thoughts? Um, well, we haven't. We have. When was the last time we had this position filled? I don't know. Uh, we had Murdy. I think Murdy was our last Yeah, and then a while. Rob Reynolds from the Highway Department was at different points. I think, if not in some form, across some years too. Yeah. And and so if we were if we were to appoint a tree warden and a deputy tree warden, like for our town, is that overkill? Is that reasonable? Or, or do we have candidates who would be willing to work together to do wonderful things for the trees of of Randolph? Um, it is, yeah. I, uh, what 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 kind of makes sense here? Do you, do you want to chime in, Sam? If I may. Yeah, please. Sam Lincoln. Nice to meet you. Uh, uh, is this double salary? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Going across this way so much, right? Twice, twice zero. <laughs> Two times zero is zero. zero. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, thank you for the consideration. Uh, you're talking about uh, splitting it up as a deputy. Uh, we certainly haven't had a chance to talk about anything like that. I mean, primarily my interest is in the rural uses of the of the uh, roads and the right of way, um, and the the impending infestation of emerald ash borer within the municipality. Um, and uh, but certainly there's a lot to be done in the residential areas, downtowns, and, and a lot of opportunity to keep a, a treescape landscape um, and things like that. So um, I, I have no idea what you're thinking or, or, or what Mr. Thayer's thinking or anything like that. I'd be happy to put heads together if, if, if like doing the downtown type things or anything. I have no idea. I don't want to put yeah. words in your mouth. We haven't had it. We haven't even been introduced. So. Um, but I, I'm open to, to do whatever to help serve the community in this uh, capacity and, and uh, uh, help out here, and certainly willing to do it in a collaborative fashion. So. Yeah, it was well. And I actually have more interest in the in the village proper. Mm -hmm. yeah. So since, since I think this might work out. out. <laughs> this is gonna really work. This could be great. We'll have a sudden, a sudden embarrassment of riches in terms of tree warden. And I, I think it's a really good fit. I think, you know, if it seems interest is in the rural, you know, landscape and you've got somebody who's interested in the village, I'd be happy to make a motion to appoint Sam's tree warden and Mr. Trevor, was it? There. There, there, there excuse me. Not, not Trevor. Oh, not, <laughs> not Trevor. Sorry. <laughs> Slide yeah. another one there. Here. As, as, as the, the deputy, and I think that they could split the duties amongst them, you know, village and, and rural. I second that. Okay, there you go. Okay. Sounds like we're moving forward here. This is great. You're in agreement, right? You think so? Yeah, think yeah that's, absolutely. That sounds wonderful. Trini, you're good with that, aren't you? Oh, you're good. Good in a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. I think that was easy. <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. We'll let, you <laughs> we'll let you hash it out. Yeah. <laughs> what are the select board's expectations? Well, I don't know that we've ever really defined what that role is. So it might be interesting to have you guys sit down and, and propose to us what you think needs to happen and, and what that looks like. I think the only thing I've seen is the tree warden do is go out when they wanted to cut down the apple tree on the front lawn when they were expanding the town offices. It's a great moment in Randolph history. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I could see things like, you know, okay, so there's issues where, you know, there's trees that are a danger, you know, where maybe somebody's got an issue where you've got a, you know, a tree that's dead at the top and maybe that needs to be removed and it sits over, you know, a street or a sidewalk or something like that. And that's where I kind of see some, some assistance in that area. It's like, okay, who, who's identifying those problems now until the tree falls down and hits a car? I mean, that happened you know, out here on Prince Street here a little while ago. And so it might be just, you know, if somebody's observing that stuff, it might be just like, hey, we got an issue up there, and it's, you know, is it the landowner's responsibility or is it the town's responsibility? If it's the town's responsibility, then we need to, you know, put it on the scope of work and get it taken care of. So that is kind of what I see happening here, is just kind of keeping an eye on that stuff. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I think that, you know, it, it's a volunteer job. <laughs> And, um, and any, any assistance we get, especially considering the position has been vacant for a number of years, um, is going to be, you know, welcomed with, with open arms. And, um, you know, I know that the, uh, the Conservation Commission had looked into the Emerald Ash Borer issues um, several years ago now um, and compiled a report and some recommendations, um, and it just sort of fizzled out. Um, so if, if that's something that you really want to pursue, Sam, I think that's wonderful and, and, and really needed um, to have somebody, especially with your background and, and skills, to really help give us guidance on you know, how we manage this problem over what's probably going to be a long, long period of time now. Um, so I, I think that if, you, if that's something that you're you know, thinking that you really want to focus on, I mean, I, I can hardly think of something that would be you know, more relevant at this moment. And, and, and Jeff has, has, ex, has expressed uh, a desire to, uh, to you know, to, to look at the trees that we have in, in the village and to make our downtown more inviting and 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 have healthier trees and and if if he can you know even even make a, a dent in that issue I, I think that would also be a wonderful thing so I, I think you guys kind of know what you want to do and and if you follow through on it I think we'll be grateful. 
if I can add uh, a couple of things that, that part of the conflict, the statutes that were rewritten a couple of years ago was that there were uh, conflicting statutes over who had authority to manage vegetation in the right of way, and it led to some multi, some like million dollar lawsuits. And um, so that's been clarified, but the town now has, um, I don't know if an obligation, uh, but the, the town can designate what's a shade tree. This, this term, this phrase shade tree going back uh, far back in the statute, nobody really knew actually what a shade tree was supposed to be. Some said it was a horse tied under it on a road to rest and, and cool down on a hot summer day and things like that. So as of right now, Randolph doesn't have any shade trees designated. It says in the definition of the statute what a shade tree is. Um, and so that might be another thing is that, that that might be very clear as a municipally planted or managed tree in the downtowns um, and whether or not that spills over into the rural areas and things like that that's probably to be discussed and, and, a, and a recommendation of public either to leave it leave it alone or to designate certain areas things like that so that that, that all can be done um, and certainly there's opportunity uh, we can talk later but um, the urban and community tree program with the state has a lot of resources and, and uh, I can connect you there and help you know any, any which way glad, glad to be helpful so so is your goal to preserve the trees because I, I, one of the right-of-ways in town is my property. And so are, is the goal for these positions to protect them? Protect the trees? Well, I think there's... there's that, I mean, Safety, of course, but like, not just cut them down because they're in the way? Well, there's the hazard trees, there's the maybe infestations, things like that. Um, and I think, again, as uh, other things have been dis often discussed here, there's, there's private property rights too, you know, rural. Again, some of these historical conflicts came. Farmers wanted to manage their hedgerows to reduce the amount of crops that were shaded and things like that. So I think it's a, you know, if it's, if it's your property and you want to preserve it, um, uh, preserve the trees there, that I think that's important as long as they don't become hazards. I also think one of the major lawsuits in the state was over the municipality removing trees in the right of way to uh, expand the road, do road maintenance without getting the permission of, of the landowner that owned the. So a lot of that has been uh, a process has been laid out in these new statutes for which the landowners are notified and, and the, the community uh, things like that. So there's a there's a process now that's been set forth so that people are aware and can comment things like that. Yeah, all of these things offer us what we could desperately use, which is clarity when somebody calls. And to the extent that whether it's the shade tree ordinance and some of the street tree planning and the Emerald Ash Borer stuff, we get a call and we know who to coordinate with and where to go and what's going to happen. That's a that would be a huge win, I, I think, and, and something I, at a staff level would be very would be very Pretty interested helpful. in. Yeah. Because right now we sort through each one kind of on a case-by-case -case basis and with a vacancy in the warden's job, it makes it a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you just lighten Trevor's load. Yeah, that was in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Less phone calls. That's right. Well, so, yeah. No, but you... Now we can just feel them. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. So I jumped. All righty. Thank you, right. gentlemen. Our Thank you. Filter committee had two folks. They do, and I can speak to both. Um, uh, to the credit of the Arts and Culture Committee, they've actually sort of put together a formal application process that answers a lot of the questions that we typically ask here at the select board of people who are interested in serving. And um, you have in your packets uh, formal applications to be on the Arts and Culture Committee from uh, Becky McGalliard and uh, Barbara uh, Mills, who's known to people in, in the town as Babs Mills. Both of them have backgrounds as artists. Um, Becky, a jewelry maker and a producer of um, uh, an agent for rock, uh, rock artists and, and rock musicians. And uh, Babs Mills, um, has a background as a singer both in uh, pop bands and touring Broadway productions and they're both interested in bringing their uh, arts backgrounds to bear on the Arts and Culture Committee. So uh, I will move the appointment of both Becky McGalliard and 
uh, Babs Mills to the Arts and Culture Committee, and if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Second. Does this make a full committee? What's that? Does this make a full We're, committee? We're, I believe they are, they want to be at seven, and I believe this puts them there. Yeah, yeah. They may be one shy yet, but uh, it's taken a while to replace some of the people that left last year. So. Any other questions before we call the vote? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Assembly permit for the Green Mountain Stage Race. This is the annual bike event that comes through town. They're using, I believe it's the same loop as last year. They start at the high school and, and it's primarily, I think, 12 and 12A. Um, just one of the two. Gary, I can't see it. He, Gary might be on one of the organizers. They will have, according to the thing, more than 500 folks. They coordinate with the sheriffs for traffic control, those types of things. We have their certificate of liability insurance. Um, and we'll coordinate with them on anything they need. And, and I am on if there are any questions. All right. Um, so we've done this. Same race in the past. I haven't heard of any issues. Yeah, but not the last four, year. Five, yeah. four or five times maybe. Yeah, now? yeah. this is like the fifth year. So, anybody have any questions or concerns, or want to make a motion? I'll make a motion to grant the assembly permit for the stage race. Yeah, I'll second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Any other business? I don't have any for you. And manager's report? Nothing to add to that. What's written, except that, as I mentioned earlier, the Howard Hill project is should be starting <coughs> soon, perhaps as early as next week. Um, so that's one of those grants and aid. It ties back to item B there. This is the grants and aid project from the last round that we're going to be completing. So we'll have to identify the project for the next round. But this will be some, primarily some ditching, stone lighting, maybe a little bit of road surface work. And that will, that's one of the stretches in that area that is <coughs> hydrologically connected and you know, the red areas, meaning that they're in terms, they're in need of improvement. So uh, should help us get those all to, to green. It is the color that you're trying to go for with those, so. North Land Off Road wasn't one of those, right? No, it wasn't one of those. Originally with North Randolph Road, we had, um, we got some grant money for a scoping study to determine what the action would be. <clears throat> and then in looking at it again with the new highway crew capacity, it was one of those with an excavator um, and some certain other provisions we could do this ourselves. And so we started to look into that, price it out, link up with folks from DEC and others, and came up with the fix that was there um, so the slope wouldn't keep eroding. Because all the study would have produced essentially was your two primary options are close the road or, or do a version of what we did. Um, and the version of what we did was less than what we were looking at for a grant match for just the, the scoping study. So we saved money and jumped to the end. Got it done. Yep. Which was nice. That was, that was great. Yep. Great. Entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Whoop, you need this is a two because of the collective bargaining one. We're going to do the finding and then. What do we need? So the first one is the motion to find executive sessions necessary and prudent, and that premature general public knowledge would place the town at a disadvantage. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now you get to enter if you want. That motion. Um, makes a motion to go into executive session. Mm -hmm. 
We have a second on that one. Yeah, yeah. Patrick second. Motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those. Motion carried.